Okay, share my screen here. Yeah, so um, yeah, official uh, welcome and thanks for everybody who could join to the uh, uh, 22.2 .2 Siebel Friday. So that's the, the funny number everybody's making fun about. Uh, and uh, Siebel is now in the second release of Siebel 22. So of course we talk about that release. And as you can see on the list here, uh, no no official new features. So no, no big new features as per the release notes. Um, but I found a few interesting bits, uh, which are not necessarily related to 22.2, .2, but earlier releases. Um, and that's so, so it's mostly a throwback presentation. So, so I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the update highlights, more or less, that you get with 22.2 .2, or maybe with earlier versions. Um, and then um, I'm, I have plans to give you a little bit of an update on the Siebel Hub community, what, what happened on the Siebel Hub recently. Uh, there's lots, uh, lots of um, movement there. And I got a surprise sneak preview into some videos I've been making. So you're going to be the first to get the the links and you can watch the video firsthand before they are published. So that is kind of a the benefit of joining the Siebel Friday and a kind of incentive here. And of course, any discussion we uh, yeah we break off here. That's that's of course always encouraged. So please speak up and use this as a community platform. So um, yeah, the the first thing that I found while browsing the, the bookshelf uh, guides, which I, I make a habit in, when a new release is out, uh, there is some documentation now on a specific service, a business service called LOV Imports Service. And some of you might have been using it or are actively using it. And I would be quite interested who, if anybody in the room is using that. So please yeah, speak up or, or type in the chat. And uh, that's that's like the documented for the first time in, in the official public bookshelf. Uh, but it has been around since, mm, Brian will correct me here, 19 dot something or even 18 dot something. I can't, I'm not sure anymore. It's, it's been a long time. And previously you had to follow some instructions on Oracle support to actually create that business service manually. Uh, then create the class integration object it uses. It seems to be based on EI Siebel adapter, uses integration objects, and it's just for inserting or upserting, I would have to say, uh, not for exporting, by the way. And that is one particular business service I found being used quite a lot during recent projects. And Oracle has put the documentation in the REST guide documenting as a REST API, which is of course very meaningful because it's a business service. You can call it through REST API, uh, but it's a business service. So of course we can call it from, we can call it from any other means. When you know how to call a business service, there are like 25 different options to call a business service. So REST is one option. Uh, so there is, uh, Lorian says in the chat, you, you did use it during during your migration upgrade from 15 to 20. Okay, so you, you use the manual created option. Um, Alex, if I may, just, uh, you're right, that we basically just provided the documentation uh, for this, but we also at some point, and I don't remember when, but like somewhere, let's say 2110-ish, <laughs> we added, um, we did add the support to repository upgrade to have it actually create the um, repository objects for you. Yeah, that's coming up. Oh, okay, you got that. Okay, <laughs> but, great. but yeah, thank, thanks much, Brian, for, for pointing that out. Uh, the manual creation was necessary until, yeah, as you say, 21, late 21. <laughs> um, and recently I, I noticed also because I, I frequently run the, I run updates training machines, etc. And I always like a habit 
run the repository upgrade at least once. Uh, it, if you want to like experiment with that, take a backup of the database or copy the database, because the repository upgrade, of course, it imports some repository artifacts or a lot of them, depending on your version gap. Uh, and and since a few releases, you're right, uh, Brian uh, is com is uh, the LOV import service is part of the uh, master repository, the and so it is part of the repository upgrade. But also, correct me if I'm wrong. When you upgrade to twenty two dot two, for example, you run an upgrade, you you get the LOV import service in your into your repository through the merge. Yes. Anytime, if you're doing a pre-17 upgrade and you go to the latest version, so 22.2 today, um, you never, you don't need to run repository upgrade because all of those things are in our master repository. You oh, just get yeah. them for free. So it's not just this service. It's yeah. every, every change we make to the repository. Right. Because you import the latest master repository of the version you're upgrading right. to. No need to run the repository upgrade. This. Right despite the name which has led to some confusion <laughs> yes i know <laughs> yeah. this one was uh this and the post install db setup which is also a bad name because that's not really what you're doing uh, this is um yeah. unfortunately <laughs> that's somebody chose those before i was paying attention <laughs> okay maybe we should we should vote for new names for these utilities it's too late maybe so it's like post yeah. post update update utility <laughs> <laughs> okay yeah. but uh yeah, I I have a recording on the on the twenty two dot two update summaries as usual on the U YouTube channel. So, will not repeat myself because it gets rather lengthy. But I thought it's good to recap the LOV import service and its role. Uh, actually, the role is um, twofold: one for developing list of values in a development environment, or actually bringing them into the database. So here are the options we have now at the, at the time of this uh, Siebel Friday and earlier releases. You can always manually, of course, ever since you can create a list of values manually in development environments. You have to watch what workspace you have opened with basically the parent main or integration workspace is where the LOV will be active. Um, you don't need, if you're on 20.3 or higher, you don't need to create a dummy work de development workspace anymore. So you can do it right away. Uh, but when you have larger amounts of list of values, you want to kind of bulk insert them, then that's the LOV import service used against the DR environment. Uh, so you specify the workspace in, in the structure. So if we go back one slide, you can see that in the Oracle example workspace name and the parent workspace. So it will create that workspace if it doesn't exist under the parent. Um, and also just honor, honorable mention here, EIM is Enterprise Integration Manager is also available uh, since a few years to bulk insert list of values. You have, you have to use this special Oracle provided IFB file to manage the workspaces. So that's for development environments. Um, I, I would guess the the audience, people in the audience could confirm in the chat, uh, manual is the number one entry point during development. Am I right? Sorry, what was that? I didn't understand your uh, manual Manual LOV entry is the, is the main use case for creating list of values. Not, not many people are like creating a thousand list of values. Well, if you do an upgrade from pre-17, you probably have a lot of garbage LOVs in your development instance because, you know, you requirements to say, we're going to need a pick list here and some developer builds it, but they don't know what the actual values are going to be yet. So they, right. put, you know, that mouse, right? Now with 17 plus that would get migrated to your downstream environments, including production, and you obviously don't want that. So there is a, a pretty standard bulk thing you want to do is to export your your LOVs from production and essentially overwrite everything oh. in, in dev. That's a, because that's a then when you upgrade production, 
it will get the it, basically the same values will be maintained, right? As opposed to getting all the junk LODs that were in your dev instance previously. Right. Yeah, that's so, a good point. Yeah, thanks. That's one scenario where this LOB um, EIM job can be very valuable. And then we also have customers who um, update these things incredibly frequently. Uh, we found. Um, and actually have uh, automated jobs. So it's like there's spreadsheets that people are allowed to go into and add things into the spreadsheet, and then they can either yeah. import them into the EIM table and run it, or they can um, you know, have it rest straight out of Excel if you want. Uh -huh. um, and uh, so you know, they are useful for that kind of thing as opposed to you know, the truly, you know, that may be a little more accessible for some business analysts than having to go into the development instance yeah. itself. Yeah, and they, they may not even want them in that development instance. <laughs> so, um, those are some of the scenarios where bulk loading seems like it's pretty, pretty regularly happens. Okay, that's that's actually good. Yeah, and uh, I see in the chat, uh, Nitin, for example, mentions using any custom business service, custom scripting. Uh, of course, that's an option still to read a CSV file or Excel spreadsheet, and or uh, there's probably still copies of the magic Excel spreadsheet with the macro that. That connects the table, <laughs> and that still works because it's yeah yeah the um yeah it's just that you have to go through one of these service or just the UI and you have to use our custom LOV IFP file because when you actually insert one LOV you actually need to insert it into every integration workspace yeah right and that's so the point that's special right. handling to like do the initial import and then take those results and stick them into a, um, a workspace into a, another batch once for each other workspace and then import that one. Right. And and that's complicated and the LOV import service does everything for you. Yeah. And EIM, the EIM job will. EIM as well. Yeah. So these you are like. One, and if you have 10 integration workspaces, it'll create the 11 right, records right. for yeah. the other 10. So, so that's the, the, the slide shows the officially documented more or less options in a, that they, they could read up in bookshelf, notwithstanding any custom scripting or custom goodness or badness <laughs> that you, you're trying. Okay, and that's for development environments. And then the other role is actually migrating from development to RR to higher test or production. Uh, there's still manual work is possible. So you could go to the production environment, log in, Great list of values uh, that's opened up again since 19.3, yeah, I guess 1903 something. Um, and but still, you probably opt for the first on the list here, the migration application, because that has a full-grown, full and incremental version of the application workspace data service. Has that system preference, which controls the conflict resolution. Um, so the migration application is probably, and that's where I would solicit your feedback in the chat or orally, uh, migration application is the number one tool to bring LOVs from dev to test or dev to prod. Um, that... Alex, one question. I have seen, can I go ahead? I mean, yeah, just... yeah, sure. Okay, so uh, I have used uh, a version of like 20.9 of IP, IP, IP 20.9. And actually, what we have observed uh, when we do an incremental RR at that time, what happened like from dev to SIT or, or let's say dev to SIT or dev to production. Uh, sometime uh, what happened like LOV gets missed from UI. What I mean here, uh, there is a max version number and a min version number on the LOV table it maintains. Okay, right. the value is uh, zero and 10,000. What happened sometime? Um, the value for the max version sometime actually what happened after migration it changes to some other value and what happened due, what happened due to due to which actually when when you see on the ui the lov is not visible although if you check in backend it is uh -huh. there with respect to that in, uh, integration workspace or main workspace so this looks like a bug okay i but, mean i mean uh, is there any fix we we found in new sure. releases I'll direct that to Brian. <laughs> um, I, I feel like I've seen a bug on this, um, but 
I, I don't remember the details off the top of my head. I, I uh, think we found you could reproduce sure. it. Um, but uh, if, if you want to reach out to me um, with yeah. specifics, um, you know, please do. The other thing is, if you're on nine. I think we have this defect when it's all, it's all, I believe it's already fixed it in one of the versions, but actually to work around, you need like to remove all previous repositories. So before like, before incremental migration. So it should be only one repository. And in this case, it's, it's not going to happen. Definitely. Yes. You should only have one repository. Uh, that's actually, I, I don't contradict that. That's not true. I think that Jason, for example, has five. <laughs> if I remember, maybe that was someone else. Um, even I observed that due to due to multiple. I mean, I only raised that that bug actually in Oracle SR, and I got the comment saying that there are multiple repository. It may be it's giving problem, but I found this is not the thing. I mean, during migration only. Sometimes it happens. Sometimes it doesn't. And it, there is no there is no consistency. So that okay. is one thing that we cannot mm -hmm. find. We could not find. Only workaround is what what I tried. I used to update all the missing LOV, I mean, all the values, the ma missing LOVs. I used to go and update uh, with the value 10,000, that particular column for the missing. And it starts it starts appearing actually on the UI. Mm -hmm. so it used to happen. <laughs> that was the workaround. OK. Yes. OK, thanks, Nitin. And, and Brian has put put his email in the chat, so you, you can reach out to Brian. Thanks, thanks, Brian, for this. Yeah. Thank you so much. It, it's a complicated matter, so there's the uh, so LOVs has ever been challenging and now with LOVs being managed by workspaces, it's more challenging even. Um, so the LOV import service is an option to, well, bypass the migration application or maybe use it in conjunction for bulk inserting, EIM is there. So these are, again, these are the official options that you can find in the official documentation of, and now let's, move on to to another uh, actually one new... last thing alex can i ask yeah. I mean, not related to bug the feature whatever you were explaining just i have one thing to ask sometime actually we add uh, organization also on the lov by going it to by going by going in in application in lov explorer we go to the lov and we add sometime organization so based yeah. on your logged in user organization it shows the right. lovs in the drop down Okay, so will it take care? I mean, this process, uh, or specifically, we need to go and add it. The organization field. I'm not. Again, I have to uh, maybe ask Brian to if he has an answer to that. But I recall that the LOV import service covers the organization visibility because it simply has the field. No, what I'm saying, do we need to specifically go and add manually, or with this the process you are you explain? Uh, in a few minutes back. Well, I, I would see the problem is that you don't have the exact organizations in your development environment. That's the problem. And that... Uh, no, no, no. <laughs> this is not a problem. This is not a problem. I'm asking <laughs> the, 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 the method which we are using, will it support that or not? I, I think maybe we should take it offline because it... Yeah. Cause it yeah. You'd, you'd have to give me so much detail that I'd, we'd hold up the whole call. No, no, Although I will I'm mention. Saying, I'll, I'll give it. I'll give it. No worries. Okay. Yeah. So, Although, Alex, I would like to mention the organizations do work properly in recent versions. Um, so even so, as long as you have the same organizations, it will work. Yes. Even though they will have different organization IDs, we do map it to the um, to the actual name yeah. during the migration. Not so, so, so the, the integration um, object and all. For LOV import service takes care of it. Oh no! Um, or no, I was talking about having different uh, the the migration case where you have migration application different orgs. It, even if they're the same name, they're going to have different row IDs, right? And so the the foreign keys on LOVs aren't going to work properly, right? Based on row ID. So, but we fixed that about oh. Eight, nine, yeah, ten months I ago. Recall, I recall something about yeah. that. So that uh, so that part does work properly yeah. now. But yeah, I mean, the LOV import service. You just organization is one of the um, fields. Yeah, it's one of the attributes you can pass in. So yeah, that works too. Mm -hmm. Okay. So yeah. So so let's put everything on the parking lot to relate to LOV import service. And um, I see I see in the chat that.
Brian added a note, um, we'll soon can expect <laughs> a workspace enabled uh, data maps, responsibilities, views. Okay, wow. Uh, can't wait for that. And uh, the, the only real new feature in 22.2 that I found is a system preference, which is actually seed data. Um, and that system preference defaults to false and it enables runtime events for set attribute. And so it is mentioned in the release notes that now you can use UPT, usage pattern tracking, if you, if you set up an event for that and have the system preference to true. Uh, you can track the application level set attribute event. So I, I tried it, run, run, run it with the settings and in my UPT file, I got hundreds of, of set attribute events uh, because the, all the seeded runtime events that run at application start or session login. Um, so it seems to work, yeah. No, not sure if there's any, any more to tell about this. Uh, Alex, th this is a new a new thing added to UPT because I used UPT in 20.9, it is there. But you're saying like it, it, it will track the at profile attribute as well? Um, I mean, this is... So this is new in 22.2, this is a new, and plus a system preference that, that is seeded into your database. Um, so you can opt to have visibility of the what I noticed, it's the application level event, so runtime events that set attributes. Uh, so okay. it's not, it's not like if you have a script set doing set profile attribute, I, I, my guess would be it's not tracked because it's not application okay. level. But I, I might be, I haven't tried it, to be honest. In that okay. <laughs> I tried UPT, but only for uh, application, applet and view events, mm -hmm. not this attribute thing. So I was just thinking this is the new feature added, right? In yeah, there's a new feature in 22. Okay. Okay, and uh, a while back, so here's the throwback again. Uh, a while back, there was a new field introduced, um, maximum message count for message broadcasting. And uh, very similar to the LOV import service, the f it was to be added manually by developers. And now is part of the master repository. So when you do the upgrade from pre IP 17 to 22.1 or higher, um, or you apply the repository upgrade after the update, <laughs> uh, then you get this field plus the applet, the respective applet where you control the message broadcast stuff gets, gets the new field exposed. So you can set the maximum message count that is retrieved from the server for the message broadcasting. So again, not, not an entirely new feature, but very similar. Now it's part of the master repository and you can get it automatically if you upgrade or run the repository upgrade. Okay, and also um, one version back and I kind of slipped through. So. Uh, for, uh, the last presentation uh, it should have been in 22.1 uh, presented. Uh, remember last month we talked about the um, crowd twist integration for Siebel loyalty. Now you might say maybe except one person in the room. <laughs> Hi, Jason. Uh, nobody uses Siebel loyalty much, uh, or maybe I'm wrong. So, but if if you're not not using or interested in Siebel loyalty, you say okay. I'm, not interested in those workflows, etc., for crowd twist. But these workflows introduce something interesting. Uh, I looked at one of those workflows um, and it passes an integration object instance from the data mapper directly into an outbound proxy business service for, to call the REST API of the Oracle integration cloud. So that caught my attention because that's not supposed to work in previous versions because it, there's an error message. If, if you have ever dealt with calling uh, outbound REST proxies with a Siebel message, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, and in 
1.1, there's a new uh, Siebel higher input argument you pass to the method, set it to yes, so you can see on the screenshot. And then the outbound REST proxy can process the Siebel message instance. For example, you could use data mapper to map your data to the outbound world and pass it to service like as you as you would expect. So I actually um you will see that in action in in, in one of the uh, sneak previews. So that now in 22.1 has started to be used by Oracle and actually be let's call it bug free because the I think the argument was there but it didn't didn't quite work. So good reason for for an update. Okay, any anything to add here from from your side? Yeah, this looks interesting and we're adopting more and more outbound breast calls, so we'll take a look at this. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Jason. And and uh, uh, Florian told me earlier, um, I, I work with Florian re frequently, that they also look into that with respect to replacing maybe previous code that has to be written to, to well, to massage the I.O. instance in, into something that the outbound REST proxy could process. But now these, these days are hopefully over. Okay, so um, let me go to uh, here. Yeah, so that, uh, there's actually a new, well, not new, but uh, I want to draw your attention to the Siebel Hub YouTube channel, uh, which is a growing community, uh, which is uh, which is very, uh, I'm very grateful for this. Um, and it, I don't know if you know this, but if you if you're active on YouTube, uh, you get features. Um, um, how how do you say that? Uh, the the more visitors you have and the more views you have, you get features um, enabled. And one of these features is the community tab for the Siebel Hub. And I'm not not trying to replace anything uh, like we have the Siebel Hub blog, but uh, if you go there um, and I put the link in the chat. It's a bit lengthy, but you can you can find the Siebel Hub YouTube channel and then click the community tab. And I did some experiments there with kind of what is the reach of, of, of Siebel Hub on YouTube. So I put up some polls and uh, don't hold your breath because they're like, uh, they're real polls, they work. Uh, and if you, if you want to follow the link um, and maybe you haven't seen the polls, uh, you, you might want to click and I, I'll refresh that page and we'll see if, if you get any more votes. So the, not many votes, so 33, and that was four months ago, so I didn't I didn't account for Siebel 22, but and I I don't know if the people really clicked on the correct answer, etc. So that's the thing with online polls. But an interesting number here: 61% uh, claim to be on Siebel 20 or 21. So I would add Siebel 22 to that list as well. So that's that's a, a high number even for 33 people. Um, so, so yeah, again, so if you follow the link to the community tab in the chat, it's in the chat, so you might want to click if you haven't. Uh, then another one I did was, uh, regarding cloud, um, cloud engagement. So, uh, 12 votes only, but 50%, so six people say it, say cloud one more time. So uh, I, I, I call these the on-prem forever people. Uh, so we don't want to hear cloud. Uh, then there's no, no, nobody is doing a pragmatic approach um, and embracing the cloud. So really looking forward is another 42% uh, of the, of the minuscule uh, uh, number of votes and augment or replace even with other products is 8%. So for me, that tells me that the Siebel community is very open to the, whatever comes with respect to Siebel in the cloud in the near future. 
And uh, the the third poll I put up here uh, is what's your take on Siebel 22? So put that up when 22.1 was just out. And so like 12% are waiting for new newer releases. So the 22.1, let, let's skip it. Uh, one that's that looks like one was live on 22.1 that time and upgrading or updating right now is a lot actually 52 percent uh we still use ie three percent we can't update and well 30 percent it that's the the honey the troll honeypot question <laughs> catching the trolls here with uh I, it's called ip22 and siebel is dead no so, um, did anyone click? Let's see. Let's just reload that. Oh yeah, 36, up 36. Okay, that seems like more people are updating, upgrading. Of course, it's 22.1, now it's 22.2, thanks. Okay, and we have some clicks here. Didn't didn't change the overall. Uh, and, and Brian, of course, at my my troll uh, trap. <laughs> uh, there is no IP twenty two. Of course, we all know that. And uh, Siebel is alive and well. So that's just people having misconceptions about Siebel, and they show up here. It's the internet, yeah. Uh, okay, so what, what do you think? Is this representative? To answer that, you'd have to see how many total answers come together to give the percentages and then measure that against the total number of customers. And it depends what you mean by representative. You know, there's uh, well, a for example, uh, inside or uh, Oracle insiders would have better numbers. Do they match? Does this very unrepresentative uh, uh, sample? Oh, sorry, I didn't see. It was the number of votes there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. There's the number of votes. So it's it's not a representative sample, of course, statistically insignificant. But does it represent the what you, for example, see inside Oracle with customer feedback and or even your own research that you do? So like are 60 per, 60 percent and more customers already on Siebel 20 or higher I guess so <laughs> I, I don't know the answer I don't know whether you do Brian whether we do have a, a account like that I mean there's always people who will stay uh, with the oldest version simply because it works but there is a, a heck of a lot of uh, movement right now to versions which are greater than ip17 and of course since uh um since 21.12 uh, 21.11 uh bought out the log4j issues uh mm -hmm. or cve i should say you know critical mm -hmm. vulnerability there yeah. people are looking to move to 22.1 sooner rather than later all of a sudden. right right that that was a that was a boost unfortunate but <laughs> was a boost for yeah. for Siebel 22 yeah to, uh, because security wise the security people were just pressing the Siebel people to <laughs> go to <laughs> go to safe release yeah you could say that yeah so so yeah any we paid <laughs> <laughs> I was just say we don't have any accurate numbers on who's on what version um, the only indications we get is if someone's filing an SR, then we know. Yeah. Um, or or they talk to us and one of you tells me or tells somebody in you know in in support or dev or our ACS folks and says, um, hey, we're um planning to update uh uh to twenty two dot two in March or whatever. So that's the only way we know. There's nothing built into Siebel that that calls home, so to speak, and says, um, you know, this is um what version we're on. So um, we don't have those numbers, but um, but I agree that the CVE for 22.1 um, and now 2 uh, 
you know, it, it definitely accelerated that, but something to, that I'm trying to explain to some customers who maybe are like, well, we're pretty happy on 20.9. I'm like, well, if you apply monthly updates every three months, roughly, I'm saying, I think that seems like a reasonable number. Then when you have an emergency thing, like the 22.1 log4j fixes, when that happens, you are, um, you know, you, you're no more than three months behind. Right. So the effort in taking that update uh, maybe, you know, is is less, is far less than if you're on 19.3 right. and you want a solution for the log4j problem and you have to jump all the way to 22.1. The possibility of there being some sort of change in the software that affects the customer is much greater in a two-year period than it is in a three-month period. Oh, so yeah. exactly. having that regular cadence, oh, yeah. I, I think, is really important as more and more, you know, security-related things, um, you know, Mm -hmm. come up right i mean it's just it, yeah. <laughs> the nature of how we're built with so many third parties right now that that it it is going to be a concern so anyway Ooh. just my kind of philosophy of why you need to stay current is just in the long run it'll make your life easier when something like this happens okay Th thanks much, so Brian. From, yeah. much needed uh, hi hi this is chris speaking uh, so from my experience the culture of doing an update every three months is still not there in our customer landscape. So I have one customer they try to, to keep keep with every month or every three months, but but most say okay, old school we have a running version, so we will keep it twelve or okay. twenty-four months and then we will do yeah, the and, next and, and I yeah, I said I so I said I think that's a dangerous approach to take for the reason yes, I said. Yes, but I think it's a um, cultural thing because it, it is because who it, are responsible for for this application they they run it. I, I understand, uh, and and that's something that I've been trying to talk to to people about, and I'd be interested in having a you know very long discussion or focus group uh, session on this topic. But um, I I agree that it's largely um, a um, a cultural thing is that people have a perception that a Siebel upgrade is a mm -hmm. uh, $28 million three-year project. And it's it's not. Uh, if you're going from, you know, like I said, 2110 to 221, you know, I mean, the, physically installing it in your dev environment with 22 languages takes less than 25 minutes. You know, it's like, it's just no, like I just tested that on a laptop with everything running on the laptop. Um, you know, and then obviously you need to test, but I feel we're in a place now where people should be also looking at automated testing so that they can quickly, um, you know, do that sanity test to make sure nothing's broken. Um, and we're trying to give more info about exactly what we changed in the in the um, post install DB setup and repository upgrade report so that you can focus your testing as needed. So, you know, I, I, slowly I'm hoping that we will get to a point where that culture changes, but you know, you, you're absolutely right. I mean, it's been, you know, it, it's always been there. The, it's going to take. Three yeah. Years. But you also have to tie this into not only this, the Siebel piece, but all of your peripheral stuff like BI publisher and web logic and all that stuff. So usually if you're going to go through that cycle, and I see that a lot too, is concentrating on just maybe the OS patching, but not necessarily all the application patching that goes on uh, with inside the enterprise. Yeah, well, Brian, I've always found that to be an interesting phenomenon that people say, well, why can't you support um, 8.1.1.6 on Windows 2019? Like, well, wh I, why, why are you updating your Windows to the latest version, but you're not talking about updating your Siebel version? I've always kind of find that to be an interesting thing. Hey, Brian, this is Nick. Uh, yeah. We have a big problem with yeah. the repository upgrade because of the CTMS pieces that are in there, that if we implement them, they break everything in our application. Really? Okay, so well, that's a major problem. Is I need to be able to not bring in certain pieces to the repository, whether it be a temp workspace or whatever. Uh, those particular product lines need to have their own install. So you can either yes, install it or not install it. Um, well, one, that should not happen. <laughs> Two, um, if you're running repository upgrade, you should not be running it against May, main. You should be running it against some future month's release or whatever your 
uh, schedule is so that you so that it's underneath one of your own integration workspaces and that gives you the opportunity to um, test what's in it against your work before delivering it to Maine. So, um, you know, if you do find those problems, you can you, know, you could delete those objects or inactivate them before you deliver to your integration workspace if you are finding that to be a problem. And I must um, not have seen the instructions on how to do that. Okay. I mean, I, I can share that, but that's, that's really the, the way I recommend it. And I is you should think of the changes you get in repository upgrade as being, you know, in, in practical terms, it's no different than something one of your developers could have chosen to do. Right. Um, yeah. But it's, we're just providing them to you. Right. And so your developers wouldn't do things directly under main they would do them under some integration branch and then you would unit test them and then you would um you know do a rebase and then you'd test again and then eventually you would merge so you'd merge it into right now let's say you have a you wanted to install 222 today and you wanted to um actually put it in production in april i don't know you know you, you probably have an integration branch for April already, I would run repository upgrade against that branch so that you can test it with your customizations and be able to um, just inactivate something that's broken. I mean, if, if CTMS is breaking your other stuff, then inactivate it. Although, again, I'm a little surprised because our stuff tends to be additive. So that's a little strange, but we could follow up on that offline to see why that's happening, why it was breaking things, because that's we, we specifically test for that. So I don't know if it's, you know, your customizations or what, but that yeah. we, we are very strict now, unlike IPs in innovation packs, it was a free for all. Our developers could change anything they wanted anywhere, <laughs> but we don't do that. Now we have process in place that things are intended to be additive where there are changes. It's to directly fix a bug um, and, and so on. So I wouldn't mind following up with you on that and maybe getting the clinical trials team as well so that they understand what's happening because that that violates our philosophy <laughs> right now of how we're uh, providing new content. Yeah, because we haven't done a repository upgrade since 21.5. Okay. Um, okay. So, yeah, please touch base. Right. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Th thanks, Nick and Brian, for, for this very valuable. Uh, and yeah, the repository upgrade, uh, in, in my opinion, yes, uh, I agree with Nick that it sh might benefit from an opt, like a, a checkbox. I, uh, Brian, you mentioned inactivating stuff, but maybe even more in terms uh, of documentation or opting out of some, some stuff or not. The, the issue with that, for everyone to understand, is that if we have two features and you only want one of them, um, we have to test uh, the scenario where you do neither of the features. You do feature A or you do feature B yeah, or you take feature A and B. Understandable. And that number grows exponentially. If it's three mm. features, it's eight. At four features, it's 16 combinations. Right. Makes, it makes sense, and yeah. <laughs> the reality is that even with automation, there's just not, you know, we're at a point where there's just no way. There aren't enough servers at Oracle and we build servers. It's just not, you know, it, it's yeah. just not feasible to test every combination. And it also causes problems when a problem happens and, and somebody comes back to support because they right. may not even right. know because a consultant... Uh, no offense, you know, the consultant comes in and does the initial implementation and picks and chooses these, and then they leave. Mm -hmm. And now the customer is not even sure <laughs> which ones they picked and chose. So it's just a, it's, it's tricky. And we're trying to find mm -hmm. the balance by having processes to avoid what Nick is describing. Um, uh, maybe, so maybe, I would maybe. like to follow up separately on that. Yeah. If, if I may suggest that one thing I've been thinking about is maybe, maybe, um, apply some sort of, you know, grouping because like some things as you discussed with Nick are clinical trial stuff. And definitely some customers would opt out of that because they, they simply not using it. Sure. Uh, but if like the crowd, but if I'm a financial work. services customer, changes to clinical trials shouldn't affect me anyway. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, also, yeah. That's why I want to understand Nick's situation better. So mm -hmm. to see what went wrong with that. Okay. So yeah. Also, 
thanks for everybody who is active in the chat. I see uh, Jason uh, here pointing out uh, their version 21.10, adopting 22.x post Kubernetes go live in May. Okay. And also Jason talks about impediments to applying frequent updates because of the downtime in production and you're working with Holger on applying rolling upgrades. Okay, so that's a that's a thing. Yes, it is indeed. So and rolling update is the, that. Mm -hmm. it, it is possible to uh, take down one of your SES servers, uh, apply your update, uh, run the uh, DB upgrade scripts from there, and then in a controlled manner, uh, roll out the rest of your version updates on, against the rest of the servers. Okay. There's a little bit of a process to it, but it does minimize impact to the users rather than taking an hour or two of complete downtime uh -huh. to apply all the binary updates. Okay, great Great to hear that there's a, a solution at least, as, uh, albeit not officially documented. <laughs> yes, uh, and I, I think given we that we're all friends a, here, I wanted to share that. I, I think, Jason, you were a little bit of a guinea pig on that, but the idea is for us to publish that document soon, mm -hmm. if it's not already out there. Oh, yeah, great stuff. I mean, we built it in response to you, I'm saying, Jason, to, you know, to your needs. Um, and so, you know, now that we've established, now that you guys have established it worked, it's good to hear it's working. Um, we can we can look at documenting it more formally mm -hmm. for everyone. Okay, great, great to hear. Oh, much much pro much progress. Uh, okay, one one thing is on on the uh, list that the official to dos or uh, discussion points. So it, it, I'm staying on the Siebel Hub YouTube channel and. There are some videos which you can't see in public right now. And one of them is public. And I started, uh, well, doing more videos because blog posts is fine. But these days, people enjoy videos on their phones and tablets and uh, learn from videos a lot. Uh, so whenever I have a blog post to write where there is a lot of, well, steps to do and coding maybe, so I created these code along videos. So uh, one of them is online already. It's it's the open UI. It's an open UI example. So I take frequently I take up some old blog posts that, well, some people send me comments and say, "Wow, this this doesn't work for me anymore." Yes, because it's like from Siebel 15 or earlier. Uh, there are some very old blog posts out there, so I revisit those blog posts. And then I'll do them in 21, 22. So uh, this one that you're looking at is uh, a code along. So you explain every each and every step and it's implementing an attachment viewer in the browser. So you can, uh, you don't have to download the attachments. You can simply look at them in a browser window. So, okay, are we back? Yes, yeah. now we can hear you. Yeah, yeah. sorry, sorry, that was yes. um, I, I think the video broke <laughs> broke my my router or something. <laughs> so now I'm back. So yeah, so uh, this, if you're interested in this example, of course you can watch the whole video. Uh, so the point is uh, looking into attachments uh, like this. Here you see the click on one attachment uh, opens a that's color box. And the attachment is downloaded actually and and shown. In this case, it's a file, a uh, very tiny file here, or it could be a PDF, whatever the browser can display. So without having to download this. Uh, and the other two that I've created, but not uploaded yet, or uh, made public yet, they are uploaded to YouTube. Um, and I make them available for you by simply posting the, the URL in the chat. So the first one is actually one which has to do with the outbound rest thing. And uh, oh, Alex is away again. Huh? Uh, sorry, that is somehow I mean, having trouble. OK, am I back? Yes. Yeah, so, here, so yeah, they, 
the two the two code along videos that I would like to share with you as a sneak preview. Uh, I'll put the URLs in the chat. I will refrain from launching the video as it kind of breaks. <laughs> so the first one that you see is a outbound REST problem. Uh, like how do you do outbound REST if you don't have a Swagger file? Uh, anyone face that problem? I am not yet. Okay. <laughs> okay. So yeah, I did. Yeah. Uh, okay. Is you don't have a Swagger file, but you have you can make a Postman connection. So here's in this video you see how to bypass that problem, then import the Swagger file and get an outbound REST proxy. And in this video, I also tried a new argument that we talked about the uh, Siebel hierarchy input. So uh, later in that in that video, there's a workflow process put together with EI Siebel adapter, data mapper, mapping data, order. Um, I'm using a fake service on the internet to well send Siebel order data. Um, and you see the whole process. Okay, and the other the other video which you get exclusive sneak preview uh, is in your chat now. And that's actually revisiting the unified messaging uh, service, uh, UMF, uh, usage, Unified Messaging Framework or service. And that is something you might know from order management. And there's a very old blog post and I've been revisiting it and um, showing how, to, how you can use the UMF framework to pop up messages without uh, a minimum of code. Let's say you have to write some code, but it's a minimum, no browser code, etc. So, yeah, so this, this is kind of a sneak preview as, as the blog posts, the related blog posts get published later in uh, the following weeks. Uh, these videos will be public, but you have them now. Yeah, enjoy. And so that's it from my side. And I've seen in the chat uh, one request from Christian. Uh, another discussion point for non-extensible objects, NEOs. Yeah. So I think NEO is the right word. We um, we just fall into a trap in November. We we had a screen where we put some. It was uh, administration data, some simple standard screen, and we created a few inside there, and the few was not visible after the upgrade. And after some analysis and support, uh, some analysis, we find out that the screen was a neo object. The screen became a neo object. And it didn't know of your view. Yes. Uh -huh. And so it was easy at this point to find a workaround and create this view, a complete view again under a, another screen. Yeah, great. And then we ask the support web if there are any plans about these NEOs to to get to get some impression of what's going on. And do we have some risks? And now we are um, doing some things with the advanced and find and fast search. So Duncan might remember 10 years ago when the Siebel Finder was replaced by this advanced find tool. And one answer was, ah, this might will get a NEO also. And I think there are some risks with this NEO object. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks, Christian. So relaying that to, to Brian again. <laughs> I'm not sure. Was there, a, was there an actual question there, though? I, I mean, there's the, the sort of statement of fact but is there a question so there is no list available which will be a neo or what is a neo so you have to try and find out you you are doing this patch and then you will see oh one of my object is a neo now and my 
my customization is not visible in the so, design. So repo, you're asking uh, in the runtime repo. Uh, I see. So asking for a list of neos that are in in the it's specific kinds, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or uh, maybe a kind of option to say, okay, yeah. I can take this or not. I'll give you one, Siebel Business Component. Yes, yes. And as Brian says there, you know, if you look at the admin views, there's a whole bunch of admin views. If anything's a BC on those, then there'll be Neos. But yeah, you, the one that you were talking about, the Finder, uh, we ended up creating a completely separate custom Finder for you there, didn't we? Yes, yes, and we are repl 10 years after that action, Duncan, we are replacing it with the Siebel standard find. Oh, really? And, yes, and mm -hmm. we are struggling with the same requirements 10 years ago. Um, so we want to to uh, show more more details in the in the result view and things like that. And we have, yeah, I think we have seven service requests open in this topic now. And in one service request that was, oh, this will get a new or something like that. And yeah, this is a fear I see with this Neo as a feedback to Brian and Duncan. Might be some trouble in future with this Neo objects. So I think people are customizing on more fields that you are thinking of. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I, I've I've heard of a similar requirement from one of my customers. They they wanted a actually list of neo neo objects, which which basically a yeah what what objects are in that hidden files. <laughs> uh, I mean, you can make out the files if you look in the file system. But I don't think it's clever to show it here. But the official documentation would be would be great. I agree. I think even there, though, you know, what would be what would be your sort of uh, approach if we had a list of uh, <clears throat> had a list of uh, NEOs, and then the next month we had a new one, and you say, "Well, oh no, hang on a minute, we, we've just done something with that one, and now it's Neo." You know. Publishing the list doesn't help there. Okay. Oh, it's, it's proactive. So maybe it's it it it's um, it would be fine to see it in the upgrade document in the upgrade guide. Uh, not in the upgrade guide in the release note. Yeah, I suppose at least then you can say this is why things have gone wrong. Yeah. Yes, and then you can see okay, this object is a neo, and then you can maybe have a hint when you read this release note. I I always do this for for the patch sets that we are using. And then you can say, okay, okay, there might be something. Yeah, I almost wonder if, you know, there's, a, there's, a, there's another s uh, direction from it, although it might be an even bigger list. But I, I wonder whether, Brian, people could sort of say, we would like a, an object never to be Neo. You know, could, could we sort of take a input on that? You know, I mean, obviously things like contacts are obvious, but... You know, some of these ones, you know, where you do a project and you say, we want to extend Finder, uh, can we sort of petition for that to never be a Neo? This is the the next step. Then. Right. <laughs> yes. Yes. But but if I see this is a Neo and I, and I can say, OK, we have a heavyweight customizing on Finder. So let's let's put this patch on stop and say, let's find a workaround. <laughs> or something like that the, the rule the basic rule i would say is if something is used by an end user not an admin an end okay. user then it will never be neo okay if it's so if something is used by end users and it was made neo then i consider that a, a bug and and bad, bad work on our engineers part um because they make that decision it's not part of like the requirements it's more they, they make a judgment call on it and so on um so you know maybe we can be looking at at that in general um 
and I can definitely arrange a list. There is a neo.cat file. Maybe we could even just have a utility. You can run it against that and see what's in it. Okay. Um, and then, you know, that way you can do whatever you want with the data. You're not copying and pasting it out of a PDF. You know, dump it to a CSV file or something. Um, but um, in general, that's the, the rule that we have for Neo. If it's an end user, like business user, or a consumer using a portal, those things should never be Neo. Anything okay. else that would be seen by only developers or administrators is a candidate. That doesn't mean we're going to wholesale convert them. Mm -hmm. um, more along the lines of just as we make some changes to something, we may decide to go ahead and make it Neo at that time. One of the other benefits of it, of doing so, is that um, we can put repository changes into a Neo object without actually having to put them in your repository. Yeah, that so it allows us to distribute a feature without actually mm. touching your repository because the definition of that object in your repository is ignored, essentially. Yeah. Um, and so that allows us to fix certain kinds of bugs or things on admin views or release new features with maybe admin views to set them up um, without requiring you to run repository upgrade, which we were talking about before. So that's kind of the, the upside of having Neos is it allows us to do that and give you functionality um, without forcing you to use repository upgrade. So those are some of the trade-offs, but still mm -hmm. the general rule, end user, never Neo, <laughs> admins or developers, candidates for Neo. Okay. Yeah. We're not going to wholesale guess, do all of them. I'm going to guess there'll be some edge cases though in there. Like, you know, I help is used by users. Uh, I help uh, okay, is yes, by yes, but it's, it's a framework thing. thing. But then, like task-based UI is a framework. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So, but I it, guess the goal there is that if we, if we make those Neo, then there are administrative ways of extending them. And if, you know, right. You but need the, the framework them. for iHelp should support making yeah. changes to it anyway. So right, that's right. to the actual right. content, not to the framework part. Yeah. Um, yeah. And the same with, like I said, like task based UI or whatever. Um, and just because one thing is Neo doesn't mean something else needs to be. So, um, for example, we have um, a couple of, uh, of workflows that you can't change. And we have a couple of tasks that you really can't change. It'll break something like in, the, in say, migration app or whatever. So we've made those Neo even though the rest of the task objects are not. Mm -hmm. And it's just like any other, like an applet or whatever. So um, it, you know, we're, we're trying to do it in a place where we feel that really people should not be changing it. So I'd be happy you want to send me the, I mean, the finder thing seems like an issue. It sounds like Duncan, you're familiar with what they did. Uh, maybe we should look into that particular one a little bit more. But if anyone has any other examples where they said, you know, we're like, uh oh, this Neo thing is causing me a problem. Please let us know. Um, one problem I'm aware of already is that you can't customize the UI for them. So if you have unshipped languages, use no way for you to um, put up languages or put up uh, strings for the new language because they're it's going to get them out of an existing pre-compiled Neo DLL uh, for either English or whatever language you use. Um, so that's one limitation we know oh. of. We're going to fix that. One of the use cases, I guess, that I've run into, and this is just kind of an anno annoyance, is that, like, you know, some of the server admin screens, I would like to, you know, rearrange the default display of the applets and stuff, and that's really kind of annoying. I mean, I can definitely go and do it in each environment, but having to do it over and over and over again makes it kind of annoying. It would be nice if, if I could have just made those in the repository and pushed it out. May, you're saying, like, switching the... Like order of yeah, columns, changing like the order of the columns and the sizes of the columns. Um, yeah, right. those kind of things. Yeah, um, that reminds me of a side note thing. Um, we're also looking at making it possible that the um, for the system preference files, the user preference files, to be um, uh, XML or JSON or something. We haven't decided, but to make them human readable, which would allow you to make those changes in one environment and then just copy the XML file over. <laughs> and it would allow oh, you yeah. to the be... XML file. Right now it's an SPF file, it's not human readable. 
But if it's in some other format, then you could do things like that and be able to just use that and push it out to all your users or, or whatever you wanted to do with it. Um, so that would, I think, maybe address that. that <laughs> oh, yeah. I, yeah, I, that, I needed that actually like is helpful for years me. ago. <laughs> Right. I think we've had we probably had the situation before where other people were, you know, we wanted where we wanted to make a system preference change for a bunch of people and then wanted it to stick, but you then wanted to allow them to change it again afterwards. And right. so if you like push it out as a as a e script or whatever, then okay, what do you do to make sure that they can still override it? <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean what I would think is you'd say um you you do something that just goes to the XML file and changes whatever you know value it is. Right. Yeah, that would be very helpful. Um, you know, you could <laughs> yeah, script that, that and then they would just be able to. Yeah. You know, you run it once, and then if people want to change it again, then you know they're on their own, and you just have to worry about a way to get the the deltas in there as you make those types of changes that are stored there. Um, now I don't know. Yeah, if and be you XML would be able to... or JSON. It might be stored in the database itself. I, we haven't like I just started talking about it with. Um, with the object manager team and um, and Holger, because a lot of it's UI related. Uh, I don't. I think Tuesday. So this is very early on, but we're we are actively pursuing it. He's putting together the design right because now. whenever we had to push these out, the system preference changes out before you know you you were beholden to the fact you had to wait till the user actually logged in before they it would run the e script to make the change. And so if we could right. make a, a a blanket change across all SPFs um you know you know at the point of the release then that would be much easier than having to put it in the application yep agreed okay that that is a great discussion uh i truly enjoyed and hope you do too thanks thanks so much to to brian for the open discussion and and sharing the insights here for on the siebel friday that's much appreciated Okay. Um, any anything else from your side? Okay. So that was a great Siebel Friday. No features in twenty two dot two, but lots of discussions and lots of forward looking things. Uh, yeah. Thanks again to everyone from Oracle who who took the time to join. Uh, thanks to all of you and have a have a great uh, weekend. Yeah. Stay safe. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Bye. 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 Thank bye. you. Bye all. Thank you. Have a nice weekend.